Hi, I'm Clyde Haberman. Welcome to the New York Times Close Up. I'll be filling in for Sam Roberts. The war in Ukraine is in its fourth week. Most recently, attacks on the capital city of Kyiv have escalated, as I'm sure you know, and as of taping time here, there is no ceasefire in place. Bombings continue in civilian areas of Ukraine. Sanctions against Russia are ramping up, and upwards of two and a half million people have left the country. Right now, there is no end in sight. Neil McFarquhar is a national correspondent for The Times and a former Moscow bureau chief. He has been reporting closely on the war, following it very closely. Thanks uh, for joining me, Neil. Um, every day, one reads about talks between Russian and Ukrainian officials to solve this crisis uh, and, and the war. Are, are these talks for real or are they for show? I, I'm having trouble assessing it, frankly. Wednesday morning, uh, the Russians suggested that, you know, Finland, uh, <clears throat> after the Winter War in, in 1939, when the Russians kind of took control of it but let it be independent, was the model, and the, and the Ukrainians have, um, the Ukrainians have kind of rejected that already. Um, I think, from my point of view, I hesitate to, th to, to regard the talks as serious because the representative on the Russian side is um, Vladimir Medinsky. And Mr. Medinsky is a, you know, hardcore nationalist who used to be the culture minister, uh, and he uh, revived something called the Russian um, Military Historical Society, which was a czar. Uh, which was under the czars existed, and um, he always talked about how you know Russia was the subject of a disinformation campaign for centuries from the West, and Ivan the Terrible shouldn't be called Ivan the Terrible, but Ivan the Strict, and um, Ivan the Not So Bad. <laughs> Ivan the yeah. Not So Bad, yeah. exactly. And um, you know, last summer he gave a speech. He's now a senator, and he gave a speech saying it was incomprehensible why former Russian lands in uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine were, you know, now not under the control of Russia. So um, when you send that kind of person to be, you know, your main negotiator, I think it kind of sends a, a message that yeah. you're still looking for the humiliation of U Ukraine. Do we have a sense of just really how dire the humanitarian situation is in Kyiv and other places? Uh, obviously, the situation is dire, but is starvation at the doorstep? You know, I, all the, as you mentioned, you know, there's several million people that have already departed uh, the country, and I think uh, when uh, the, our, our correspondents talk to people in cities that are already besieged, like Mariupol and Kharkiv and uh, so forth, they find that, you know, bread and, and those kind of basic supplies are running out. Um, so far, um, there have, you know, no city has said they're, they're absolutely running out. Um, but I'm sure as the war progressive and supply chains become more difficult, that, it, that it's going to be an issue. Can sanctions against Russia really work, or does it ju just make Putin and company dig in and, 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 and Russians perhaps not aware of how they're perceived by the larger world dig in? You know, I mean, there's a long history of them in places like South Africa and Iran. Uh, in South Africa, the feeling was that they eventually they worked. worked, but it yeah. took a decade. Uh, Iran has, you know, managed to, to, to stumble through. I mean, I, I've worked there, too, and there, you right. were always deathly, not deathly, but you were always worried about getting, uh, uh, afraid of getting onto an Iranian airplane because you didn't quite know where the parts and the re servicing was coming from, and they fell out of the sky regularly. Um, so I think, you know, it will bite. You know, the, the, the economy is going to contract. Inflation is going to be up by 30 or 40 percent. Um, you know, big brands like Coca-Cola and Ikea that Russians really liked right. uh, are, are pulling out. Uh, on the other side of that, you know, the country um, has this kind of mythology about World War II and how stoic they were and they survived. And, you know, Russia definitely sacrificed more than any other country in World sure. War II and, and, and certainly helped defeat Hitler um, uh, or were, in, you know, instrumental in, in defeating Hitler. Um, and so they've kind of sold that in recent years as, you know, you know we, we can be solidaric and, and, and get through any uh, attack from the outside in the same way that our ancestors did. So I, I don't, I, you know, it's kind of a question of um, that stoicism, that traditional stoicism versus how much people have gotten used to, you know, having cappuccinos at Starbucks and, and will resent the fact that they, they can't. Um, 
We had a story the other day uh, in the Times about a lot of young Russians leaving. And perhaps this is something you yourself are working on. Is there a brain drain fear? I mean, people who have a sense of what's happening in the West and what the feeling is, so their country just walking out? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of people heading for the ex exits. It's very hard to get numbers. Um, about 5% of the Russian workforce used to work for foreign firms, and they're, of course, all shutting down. Um, so that leaves them without the jobs. And, you know, their country changed, you know, o o overnight. It's gone from kind of, you know, they love to travel and they can't right. travel because of the airplane. They're an international pariah. And a lot of these people are smart. They're well-educated. They're tech-savvy. They had a very strong IT sector. Um, you know, so um, then they can work anywhere. So they're kind of heading for the exits. Um, it is kind of, um, you know, they they depend on commodities, right, for their most of right. their income, and so oil and gas. I mean, y you could argue that oil just you know comes out of the ground, and so it doesn't need that much technology. But you know, you need some technology to improve uh, what you do get out. And you look at countries like Venezuela that are under sanctions, and their production is far below what it was. So it's it's bound to affect them o o over the long haul. You know, whether they, you know, there's a large overlap between the people who are leaving or who are horrified by the war um, and the people that were in the protest movement against Putin starting a decade ago. Um, so he has made no secret of the fact that he's perfectly happy to see those people go. Um, and, they, you know, they haven't put any limits on, uh, on people leaving. It's mostly through Turkey these days. But um, I think they will... Uh, and when you talk to those people, you know, not all of them have accepted the idea that they're refugees quite yet. Um, and so it, it's unclear. Then they've rented an apartment for one month or three months right. just to see. So they haven't really accepted their status as, 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 as having departed for good. But I think they will, uh, that educated and tech savvy and globalized class will probably stay away as long as Mr. Putin is in power. And how about Ukrainian refugees, two and a half million and more? Um, do we have a sense, would most of them really want to go back to Ukraine once things settle down, however settling down is defined? I mean, or are they, do we have a sense that people are really about to try and make new lives in Poland or elsewhere? You know, I mean, Europe is being very welcoming in terms of it, but of yeah. course it's also, it's, it's the female population and children, I think 70,000... Um, children are among those that have left. Well, I assume men between roughly the ages of what, 15 and 60 or so can't leave. Can't leave. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, presumably the wives and children want to go, go back to their, their fathers right. rather than the other way around. And, you know, it's just not clear how Russia is going to be able to run that country. They don't have the soldiers to occupy it. They haven't found um, enough sympathizers yet to join their side. I mean, in a few towns in the south, where uh, they've arrested the mayors and hauled them off. They have appointed, um, you know, kind of Russian sympathizers, and they have those sympathizers have been pilloried online as, as traitors and so forth. Um, I think they were kind of expecting, you know, Crimea, where they were welcomed, and they right. are not welcomed at all. And um, so it's unclear. That's why I think when you, your first question was about the negotiations, it's kind of everybody assumed that they kind of wanted to decapitate the regime and, and you know, kill them, uh, the, the president and the people around him. But now the talk has been, you know, if Zelensky agrees to make it neutral and so forth, I, I mean, they're not talking about replacing him, which, you know, whether it's true or not, I think they be, it's begun to dawn that, that, that the, you know, arrival of the Russians is not being greeted with the wave of popular support that they expected, at least, especially in the kind of ethnic Russians and the Russian-speaking population. Did we all get the late 20th century wrong? You know, the feeling as uh, we moved into the 21st century was that democracy is ascendant uh, all over the world, that the Internet is going to... Uh, make us all uh, informed about what's going on in the world, that nuclear war is increasingly unthinkable, and so on. Did we just get that dead, you know, I think flat it, out wrong? It, it, it unleashed forces that we didn't expect, you know, I mean, because the Internet has allowed 
you know, all kinds of e extremist and fringe voices to be amplified and, you know, that allows conspiracy theories to spread. Yeah. And I mean, it's certainly not only an issue in Russia. We have the same issues here in, in, in the United States in terms of extremism and nationalism and those, the, the, those kind of isms that we were hoping would fade uh, being resurgent. And it's also just, you know, there's so much dislocation. The immigration right. makes you know, indigenous populations or, or, or you know, the people um, in in countries uh, where they feel like they have a birthright to exist and to thrive, they feel threatened by you know immigration, and then they turn to nationalism. That isn't you know a, a, a specific issue in in Russia because they haven't let in very many immigrants. But um, I just think that um, you know the, the the openness isn't always a, a force for positive change. Mm -hmm. What might it take to bring Putin down? Is it possible? And is there any possibility of at some point him and others being brought before the International Criminal Court? Or um, you know, Russia is a huge country. So, I mean, let me start with the first part of that, yeah. actually. Um, there's no tradition of it. In all the 70 years of the Soviet Union, you had Stalin, you know, murdering the country for 30 years and nobody uh, stepped up and, and tried to prevent that. Or, or in, in, in all the years of the Soviet Union, there was only one coup uh, when Brezhnev brought down Khrushchev in 1964. And, and that was, you know, um, something that, uh, as I said, it, it, it doesn't happen. It, had, it didn't happen except for that one time. Um, so it's unlikely. I mean, there's just something about, you know, the czar and the being number one that people just don't challenge that. And uh, in terms of bringing them to justice, it, you know, it's a big kind of, it took a long time to find the people who were responsible for the war in Yugoslavia, you know, the Serb commanders for the rump states there. They managed to hide out for years. They did eventually get them, but it's a, it's a long and difficult process. So I shouldn't expect to be covering any trials in the near future. <laughs> no, I don't think uh, so. No, it doesn't seem to be. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Janine sure. McFarquhar. Good to be here. Next up, we're going to discuss hearings for the new Supreme Court nominee. Welcome back. President Biden has nominated Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to succeed Justice Stephen Breyer on the Supreme Court. Justice Breyer has announced his retirement. This is the first Supreme Court nomination by a Democratic president since Barack Obama. President Trump had three choices. With confirmation hearings set to start on Monday, what do we know about Judge Jackson and what can we expect at these hearings? Both sides are promising more civil hearings than those that greeted Brett Kavanaugh. We shall see. Joining me to discuss this are editorial board member Mara Gay and Supreme Court reporter Adam Lipcap, Liptax, pardon me, from Washington. Welcome to you both. Um, this may be the dumbest question of the week, um, but um, how is Judge Jackson not a shoe in for this job? I mean, just leaving her credentials aside, uh, both Adam and Mara, um, how many times do Republicans want to shoot themselves in the foot in terms of appealing to black voters? Uh, they're going to shoot down the first black woman to be put up for a court nomination? I'll go to you first on that, uh, if I could, Adam. Uh, you know, we're, these are such polarized times that I don't think the Republicans uh, are prepared to vote for any Democratic nominee however appealing and including the fact that she uh, will be, and because she will be confirmed, it, it, it seems almost certain, if only with one or two Republican votes or maybe none. Um, but the, the politics of this thing are such that the three Trump nominees got two, one, and zero Democratic votes. Mm. And there will be something similar this time for Judge Jackson, distinguished though she is. You feel the same way, Mara? I do. I think at this point it's all about political performance for the Republicans. This is not a question of character or a question of even policy. Um, also, it won't change the makeup of the court. No. So this is very performative for the Republicans. Um, and of course, there's always that fear if you are a, a Republican member of Congress, and especially in the, in the Senate even uh, now, that you will be primaried from your right. And so you don't want to give uh, give your opponents or potential opponents anything uh, with which to attack you, um, particularly from the right. So I think as sad as it is, this is just a moment to show not just how polarized, but I think 
um, how absolutely unthinkingly wedded Republicans are uh, to the party line and how extreme that party has become. Hmm. Some Republicans, speaking of extreme, and I'm thinking of people like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz, have questioned uh, Judge Jackson's defense of criminal defendants. Uh, and uh, did I misread the Sixth Amendment? It does not give people the right to counsel, including people accused of heinous crimes. Uh, how, how do they justify attacking somebody for zealously defending a criminal uh, uh, who, uh, defendant? So I don't get it. That's definitely a question for Adam. Okay. <laughs> I'll give it to Adam. Um, Adam. Um, it, again, it's pure politics. Uh, and crime is an issue that looks attractive to Republicans. Uh, they will have had no problem with uh, Republican nominees who've taken controversial positions saying, I was just zealously defending my client. But now it seems that when the shoe is on the other foot, uh, they would like to tag Judge Jackson, who was a public defender for a couple of years in the appellate division of the Federal Public Defender's Office. It's a great thing, actually, that for the first time since Thurgood Marshall, it seems that we'll have someone with uh, public defender experience, whereas prosecutors going on the courts and on the Supreme Courts are quite routine. Um, and yet, it looks like, again, it's good politics for Republicans. They also don't have a lot, of, lot to work with. Uh, so this may be something they see as a pressure point. So should we expect the hearings to be more along the lines of um, a kabuki theater rather than a genuine knock down brag, uh, you know, drag out battle a la the uh, Brett Kavanaugh hearings or uh, much earlier um, uh, the Robert Bork hearings of, of decades ago? You know, I actually, I think that's right, Clyde, because I don't think that there is much of an advantage to be gained, uh, you know, for more serious minded Republicans, even Mitch McConnell, for example, for dragging this out, because uh, there are Republicans like Mitch McConnell who are far less invested uh, in that performance and in fact think it distracts from opportunities that the Republican Party has. And so I, I think what you'll see is there'll be a little bit of a little bit of a hissy fit from some Republicans mm -hmm. in certain swing states. But I think ultimately at the end of the day, they know that, that, that this is a, a, a nomination who will be confirmed. Yeah. And frankly, it doesn't really behoove Mitch McConnell to drag out uh, the performance art of, of embarrassing a black, the first black woman to be nominated to the court. So he, he understands that. And as you say, it doesn't it. change the, the, the shape of the court. It doesn't really. change the shape uh, of the court. It's already their court. So. That's right. Exactly. Um, Adam, I don't know how much you want to go into the prediction business, but um, is uh, Roe v. Wade dead or at least going to be on life support by the end of this uh, Supreme Court term? Uh, I think more likely than not, it's dead. Uh, certainly, the court seems prepared to uphold a Mississippi law that bans most abortions after 15 weeks. That itself, if that's all they do, will uh, really undermine Roe very substantially because Roe says states can't ban abortions uh, before fetal viability, which is about 23 weeks. So once you get rid of that fetal viability line, and go to 15 weeks, you've done away with the core holding of Roe. But it seemed from the argument that there was only one conservative vote for that, call it compromise, which was John Roberts. Right. The five justices to his right seemed ready to do away with Roe entirely, which will completely reshape the, the, the fabric of the nation, the ability of uh, women to participate in the life of the nation, because red states will almost immediately make abortion a crime. And that will mean that poor women uh, who don't have the means to travel will have a very hard time getting abortions. But there are more abortion methods available now than there were, let's say, 50 years ago uh, in terms of pills that can be mailed. Uh, these laws strike me as not being able to to prevent that. Uh, I think Mississippi is already finding that it has not really materially uh, uh, crimped uh, the ability of people to get abortions. Well, it's somewhat like voting in the sense that uh, though it may be 
technically possible for women in this case to obtain uh, safe and secure abortions outside of their states um, by organizations and, and large scale efforts across the country uh, that are based in, in blue states often mm -hmm. to help, help those women. That may be possible, that, that is already underway. Um, like voting though, the more layers of restriction you add, the more onerous you make it, uh, the harder it will be for the most right. vulnerable Americans to receive that critical health care. And I also just want to point out that, of course, it's it's a health care issue. And so it's not just a matter of we're not just thinking about 16 year olds. Um, and I believe everybody has a right to an abortion, just to be mm -hmm. clear. But we're not just talking about healthy 16 year olds who may be seeking an abortion they can get via a pill. We might be talking about married women who have health conditions uh, who, or who find out that that fetus has a health condition make, that makes it non-viable. Um, who then will need to leave their state to go get that medical care and may be unable to do so. It can be dangerous for both the health of the pregnant mm -hmm. person and the, the fetus. So I just think uh, there, this is just a good example of this isn't in the interest of women's health. This is in the interest of politics. Fair enough. Um, Adam, one doesn't hear too much these days about expanding the size of the court uh, or about perhaps limiting the uh, the length of justices' terms, uh, are those issues just sort of dead letters at this point, or or again, are they on life support of some sort? Or uh, where do we stand on on uh, on that issue, which was a big issue uh, just two years ago? Well, when Joe Biden was running, uh, he was confronted by those issues. He wouldn't take a position on them. He did the classic thing of appointing a blue ribbon commission to look at it. That commission looked at it. It was instructed not to give recommendations, just to survey the field. Uh, but the, the music of the report was that expanding the size of the court was a dangerous business, would be done for political reasons, would give rise to a tit for tat death spiral. Um, oddly, that's the easy thing to achieve because you can do that by statute. Congress could do it if it wanted to, but it, there, there are not 50 and certainly not 60 votes for that. Uh, Joe Manchin has said he's opposed to that. Uh, the more popular reform, uh, one that is supported inside and outside the court and is the case in every high court in every developed nation around the world, is either term limits or mandatory retirement ages. Right. The notion that justices should decide for themselves when they're going to retire, when they're 85 or 90, uh, is unknown in the rest of the world and injects an element of politics into an already very politicized process on the front end, on the back end with justices trying to time their departures <clears throat> so, they, <clears throat> so they leave under presidents whose politics they share. It's a bad idea. Uh, but here, unlike expanding the size of the court, it would almost all legal scholars agree require a constitutional amendment, which means it's a non-starter. Uh, the um, do we have any sense of whether or not um, the study group that was formed is ever going to produce something meaningful, or is it just an exercise? Well, they have produced a very scholarly, very lengthy, very balanced report which uh, at the same time does not move the ball forward at all. Mm. Is Justice Clarence Thomas hopelessly compromised by the political activism of his wife, Ginny? They are an interesting couple to be polite about it, but uh, she is way out there. And uh, she was even at that January 6th rally uh, in... Uh, the riot. The, the riot. Let's call it but she the wasn't riot. part of the riot, apparently, but right. she was there. Right. Uh, I don't, I don't want right. to put that on her, but, um, but to what degree does, does the activity of a spouse inevitably spill over to um, the justice? Well, I think clearly there are some concerns there, but to, to say the least, the larger problem, though, I believe, is that the court is no longer reflective of the will of the United States uh, representative at all, really. Um, and so it is so extreme to the right at this point. Uh, and really, uh, the majority of the American people do not have uh, appropriate representation in the court. So the, the bigger question is, what kind of 
legitimacy does that institution have in the future? And what does that mean for the success or future of a democracy in which it represents one third of our government? Mm. And so until there are some reforms that are made, uh, preferably by expanding the court, or as Adam was talking about, and you were talking about, by setting some term limits, um, just making it more representative, why would uh, any American who is in the majority of the country who, for example, supports abortion rights, why would they see this court as legitimate? And it's not just Ginny Thomas, it's a larger question. Right. Adam, do you, do you feel the, the very legitimacy of the court is uh, under threat? So the court's approval rating has dropped substantially. Uh, lots of people are very dissatisfied with the court. Um, but legitimacy ultimately is a question of not do we like them, but will we follow their rulings? And there have been times in American history when presidents and others have refused to follow the court's rulings, but I don't think we're near that point yet. The Supreme Court's approval ratings, though dropping, are far above those of Congress, the president, lawyers, journalists, uh, and there's a long way to go. Now, maybe doing away with Roe will punch a hole in that legitimacy, but there's a long way to go until we get to the point where people will say, as they do in many countries, very interesting, you ruled that way, we're not gonna do that. Well, they have a long way to go to get down to where journalists are ranked, that, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Adam Liptak from Washington and Mara Gay here in New York. And for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Clyde Haberman.